New Challenges, Old Traditions, Chapter 25. In the 50 years after World War II ended, we here in Kentucky underwent changes more radical than we'd ever had in our recorded history. The atomic age has arrived in our country. Men are walking on the moon. Women's rights have expanded and, and segregation has actually ended. We have television and air conditioning in our homes. The automobile is very commonplace and communication is almost instantaneous. We have fax machines and computers and although it seems like maybe Kentucky has shrunk, Kentucky has not shrunk. She has stayed the same size. It just seems like she's shrunk because of something called the airplane. We can now go places in hours that used to take us days and months to go. So it's hard to keep an identity that we've cherished when we've got so much new modern technology encroaching upon us. And of course, some of the conceptions that other people have had about us over the years, well, some of the worst ones have disappeared a little bit, but we've got some that are still hanging on. And for instance, gambling. Whatever you think of Kentucky and gambling, of course, you always think of Newport uh, just across the river from Cincinnati. Some of it has gone away. It's clean, been cleaned up quite a bit, but that's what you think of. But the another one that you think of even more often than not is horse racing. Yes, there is sometimes crime associated with horse racing, but when you think of horse racing in Kentucky, you immediately think of the Kentucky Derby. When you think of Kentucky, they think of the Derby and the home of the beautiful thoroughbred racehorses. It's Kentucky Derby is held the first Saturday of the uh, May every year and that's not too far from here now come to think of it but when you think of Kentucky Derby and you think of the horse racing of course you've got to think of all the parties and things beforehand and uh, it just goes on for a week before and if you're going to the Kentucky Derby in a party you must wear a hat now hats are crazy sometimes uh, but this lovely hats that we hear on the left for instance that beautiful black hat I personally don't know what I would wear with it. I don't think jeans would work, but I don't think I would have to worry about it because it costs $600 for that hat. While the one on the right looks like there's less material, it's much more colorful. Uh, so, yes, it's going to cost more. That lovely red hat costs $1,200. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I don't even spend that much for my entire wardrobe for the year, let alone for a hat. But if you're going to go to the Derby, you've got to have a hat and you've got to have a really sassy hat. So along with the Kentucky Derby and the hats, you also have the image of the Colonel. Now the Kentucky Colonel was made popular in the South basically uh, at the beginning of the century, even though we knew about Kentucky Colonels in the Civil War, it would be a cartoonist who comes up with the personification of the uh, Southern Colonel. He's always going to be a wealthy Kentuckian, white suited and mustached and smiling and called the Colonel. And of course the governors of our state are always issuing certificates of colonelcy to particular people from outside the state to make them feel at home. But it really became associated with Kentucky with a man named Harlan Sanders, who wasn't even born in Kentucky. He was born in Indiana. But he came up with a franchise uh, for Kentucky Fried Chicken, started in Corbin, and he only kept it for roughly 10 years and he sold out, but uh, they kept his image. And of course, we are forever known as Kentucky Colonel and Kentucky Fried Chicken, internationally known. And when you think of the Kentucky Colonel, what do you think of? You think of him drinking bourbon. And where is he going to be drinking all this old Kentucky bourbon? On the veranda of a big beautiful home or a mint julep. He's going to watch his thoroughbreds dance in the yards and watch the blue grass and maybe there's going to be a you know Stephen Foster melody playing in the background. And it sounds great, but that's not just gorgeous. Uh, of course, this is one image, and as we discussed a week or so ago, there are other images. There is a gentle mountaineer who sits on the front porch playing with his dog or playing the dulcimer and speaks the old English. And then you have the feud and mountaineer. And of course, most people think of the feud and mountaineer when they think of Kentucky. But way back in the 30s, even, they had comic strips like Little Abner, and they had television shows like The Real McCoys, Green Acres, The Dukes of Hazard. And they always seem to show all those characters in a positive way. It looked like everybody in Kentucky was a redneck hillbilly. But I think a lot of it came about because, as your text points out, uh, President Johnson's war on poverty seemed to focus on the Appalachia. And, of course, it made a lot of people rather upset and defensive. And people would be greeted 
you know, for years, I almost hated to tell anyone I was from Kentucky because they thought I was either marrying my cousin or I was a feuding hillbilly or I had a still in the backyard. And thank heaven, some of that has gone away. Uh, I've learned more about Kentucky. I've learned more how to respond to the negative comments. But there is also another image, the one I prefer to think about. I call it the three B's. Beauty. Kentucky has some of the most beautiful women in the world. And of course, we had Miss America in 2006. Boxing. Kentucky is going to always be known as a boxing place because of Muhammad Ali. And basketball. Of course, we are the home of the National College Championships for this year, 2012. Motion pictures. Oh, there was a movie made back, I think it was 1980 or somewhere called 2010. And uh, in it, one of the main characters uh, was asked by a Russian counterpart, what do they have in Kentucky beside bourbon? And he replied, basketball. And even according to the, uh, some of the dictionary, not dictionaries, but the encyclopedias, when they think of basketball, you think of Kentucky. Um, there's just a love affair between Kentucky citizens and basketball, especially UK basketball, and of course their rivals, University of uh, Lexington. But it's not just always on the national level. Uh, we have beautiful Cumberland Falls, which I'm very proud of, but we also have high school basketball. And in any small town or community, the local high school basketball games are attended quite well, and they've got some great players, and sometimes they get scholarships to go on. And of course, there's always the hope that they're going to go really high up and, and make them, you know, uh, Sweet 16 in March. But it's not just basketball. We have other activities. We have NASCAR racing. Daryl Waltrip, he's from Owensboro. Uh, you have another driver named Danny Sullivan, and they've also had victories in the I guess, what do you call the winning circle for automobile racing? Uh, we have two men named Brewer and Nichols who won professional golf tournaments. We have a lady who even brought home a, a gold medal in the Olympics in 1984 for swimming. And a game that's mentioned in your text, which I'm not sure that <laughs> some of you younger young ladies and gentlemen would even know, uh, called croquet. That's where you have a wooden ball and, and a long mallet and you hit it on the lawn. But we even had a national championship from croquet back in 82. And you never thought of Kentucky and croquet in the same breath, did you? But, well, we did. Of course, there's fishing and hunting. and Yeah, but hunting is a very popular sport in Kentucky. And we're beginning to be a sports soccer fan sports. Uh, that's increased, especially since the, uh, the last couple of Olympics. But despite all the interest in basketball and the growth of other sports, the person who's most recognized for Kentucky is... Cassius M. Clay Jr., Muhammad Ali, whose great-grandparents were slaves. They were from Logan County, as a matter of fact. And he grew up and became the world's heavyweight boxing champ in 1964. But, um, he was stripped because he refused to go into the military during the Vietnam War over religious convictions. His conviction was overturned, and he won the title a second time. He lost it briefly, then regained the championship. Very colorful man. Um, Loved to talk and rhyme, and his float like a butterfly, sting like a bee phrase has been used hundreds and hundreds of times. But whenever you think of Kentucky and you think of boxing, you think of Muhammad Ali, and he is one of Kentucky's most beloved citizens. So when you speak of Kentucky, you've got the diverse images. You've got the Kentucky Derby. You've got the beautiful falls in Cumberland Mountains. You've got strip mining. You've got beautiful women. You've got Muhammad Ali. Uh, and all of these people are contributing. Yet with all the good that we see of Kentucky and some of the bad being going away, there are some trends in Kentucky. And I've taken the liberty of listing them by decade. For instance, in the 1950s, coming out of World War II, because we were things were so... Uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? You couldn't get them. Because the government needed them, so they were rationed. You had ration stamps. So when you got paid for your job, of course, you put the money in the bank. And at the end of the war, we had a bunch of money in the bank. Not just in Kentucky, but everywhere. And, of course, there was no such thing as unemployment. The reason you'd be unemployed was because you wanted to be. So we started spending. And, man, we became a consumer society. We bought homes and cars. We moved to the suburb. We went to the drive-in movies, which were in abundance. And then something called television, of course, entered into our culture with game shows. Meanwhile, we've got all these communist witch hunts going on in 
national news and in Washington, D.C., thanks to Senator McCarthy of Wisconsin, we've got discount stores sh popping up everywhere. And in, in the movies, oh, this beautiful blonde lady named Marilyn Monroe, oh, she was just the epitome of sexiness. And Playboy magazine starts being published. But of course, here in Kentucky, we kept one of those magazines back behind the counters because we certainly didn't want our young boys and girls to be corrupted by seeing all that good stuff. And we know they're just reading it for the articles. We know that. We build civil defense shelters because we are sure that there's going to be a World War III. And one thing that I can never thank people enough for is something called the polio vaccine. But as a child, we used to live in mortal credit, just cringe in the summertime, wondering who's going to get polio, who's going to be the one to go in the iron lung, who's going to be the one that gets paralyzed. And at the time, I had a small child, just very young, just a few, as a matter of fact, just a few months old. And I was so glad and thankful that I wouldn't have to worry about polio for my child. And we had something called Sputnik be shot into the sky in 1957. And we all just knew that we were going to be speaking Russian because the Russians were so far ahead of us which wasn't true. It's just uh, one of those things. And we had something called the U-2 incident, which uh, I don't think we even talked about that. Uh, when Eisenhower was president and Khrushchev was president of Russia, they were getting together and one of the things that Eisenhower wanted to do was to have permission for us to fly over Russian territory and let Rus Russians fly over our territory to make sure that we're living up to our agreements. And of course they said no. They didn't want us flying over their territory, so we proceeded to do it anyway. We used what they call a glider. And uh, there was a glider with an American pilot in named Gary Powers, as a matter of fact, Francis Gary Powers, and it was shot down. And it was a big stink, caused some very hard feelings and an intensification of the Cold War. Coming into the 60s, we've got a new president, JFK, and they call his time in office Camelot. And oh, everybody was so glad to see a young president, although as discussed in the last chapter, we overlooked the fact that he was Catholic because we were so wanted to stay democratic. You got the civil rights movement going on, and we had college demonstrations all over the country. And according to the television, it looked like every college in the country was having a demonstration. And I have checked, and I couldn't find any major college in the state of Kentucky that had any kind of a demonstration. So it's a case of the squeaky wheel gets the oil, and it's the big colleges like University of Berkeley in California and University of Ohio that had demonstrations, and of course that's what was covered. You've got the Vietnam War concerns because we're starting to hear more and more about the Vietnam War. And prior to that, you had the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Russia was actually installing missiles in Cuba. You got the Bay of Pigs fiasco, which was a, supposed to be an overthrow of Castro, which turned out to be a fiasco. You've got the singing group called the Beatles coming to our country. You've got more interstates being burning, being uh, built, and oh, <laughs> supposed to be bra burning, not bar burning. You have something called the Women's Liberation Movement being started, and. Uh, it seemed like that they were taking a page out of these civil rights demonstrators. They learned how to organize and how to march. And so you had women demanding equal rights. You had gay and lesbians demanding equal rights. You have the great pickers in California demanding equal rights. You had the American Indians demanding equal rights. Every time you turned around, there was some other group who was insisting they weren't getting their civil rights. Meanwhile, I, we had had a president assassinated in 63. A few years later, his brothers assassinated. Uh, Malcolm X, the leader of the black Muslims, is murdered. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is killed. Uh, it's not a good thing. And, and even Martin Luther King being killed, we thought sure was going to set off a race war to end all race wars. There were some riots. There was some looting. But thank God most of it didn't happen in Kentucky. There were demonstrations of all the other groups. And the one thing I have to mention because of my mother, uh, in the 70s, 60s, late 60s and 70s, we had something called streaking. That's where you take your clothes off and run naked through a public field or something, a football field or a basketball field or something. And, of course, there was a song, look out, Ethel, don't look, he's streaking. That my mother just would go into peals of laughter every time she heard it. I personally never saw the advantage of taking your clothes off and running through a group of people, but college students, any young and old, it wasn't just college students, they did it. Coming into the 70s, you've got the Watergate scandal. And our new president, Nixon, is forced to resign. But Vietnam is finally over. We've got space shuttles. We've got computers. And they're getting smaller and more complex, more complex. You've got something called the Moral Majority, which is a group started to try to defeat something called the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, Kentucky supported the ERA. It's one of the few southern states who did. Uh, the Moral Majority was led by a woman who was living in St. Louis, a very, 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 very conservative Republican. And 
she fought it tooth and nail and managed to lead a battle to keep the last state from ratifying. It almost it almost was. We needed one more state, and she managed to prevent it. There was a gas shortage in our new president. This time we have Jimmy Carter as president, and he wanted us to use less gas and to drive less and turn off our lights so we wouldn't use as much electricity, which we all did. Everybody cut back beautifully. So the gas companies and the electric companies raised their rates because they couldn't afford to lose the money because we were using less. An African-American woman named May Street Kid, which your text does not mention, and I think it's a shame that they don't, um, she went to Kentucky legislature and discovered that we had never ratified the 14th and 15th Amendment. Of course, it had become law without us ratifying, but she thought it was just horrible that a southern state had not ratified, so she managed to get that ratified, plus some housing uh, good done for the uh, lower class and the minority groups. 1980s, we have another new president called Ronald Reagan. We have a female governor, Martha Collins, who we discussed last chapter. We're introduced to something called AIDS, which our president assured us was a gay disease. Uh, that if you weren't gay, you wouldn't get AIDS. And we didn't know at that time you could get it through blood transfusions. We did not realize it was could be contacted between heterosexual people. Also, the Berlin Wall falls, and we think, oh, thank God, communism is over. But it wasn't over. It was just that part of the Cold War was over. So changes, were they good or bad? Well, coming into the end of the 20th century, crime rate is down. Passenger train service ends. Now, you cannot begin to compare Amtrak with passenger train service. It, there's just something to be said about the old choo-choo, chug-a-lug, coal-burning trains. Traveling on them was slow and romantic, and you were treated like a prince or princess. It was just an experience, and one you'll never have. Uh, of course, we've got better roads, uh, but because of the better roads and more interstates being built, there are smaller towns that are becoming more and more isolated. And then we have the Walmart invasion, and that is good and bad. You're getting more material and goods at a cheaper rate, but it also drives the mom and pop businesses out. And you've got Kentucky Educational Reform Act, which of course is what you are also uh, doing a critical analysis on. I'm not going to give you my opinion of that. And because of the need for more income, uh, more and more Kentucky women are entering the workforce again. But we have what they call trends in your text. And basically you can classify Kentucky's towns into three categories. You've got the crossroad towns, you got the small towns, you got the large towns. We have many more crossroad towns, which is exactly what it is. You know, roads crossing, and around the crossroads, you've got a country store. Uh, you've got a railroad stop at one time where passengers may have gotten off and on. Right now, if the train stops, it's to take on or to, to either offload or onload, uh, probably corner or some kind of freight. You have one flashing light, and it's usually yellow right at those crossroads. You have a church, and it could be one church. If you've got people other than Baptists in that town, you might have a Methodist church or a Church of Christ. But for the most part, everybody's got a Baptist church. You have a local bank and you have a post office. And sometimes a post office is even located in a local grocery store because it's not that big. And of course, you've got to have a service station and a few homes scattered around. And although not on the list, I will remind you that each one of these small towns has like a 20 mile an hour speed limit. And they have a local policeman at the edge of town who will stop you if you're going faster than that. But the medium-sized towns, uh, if they were a county seat, of course, they're going to have a county courthouse. And around the courthouse, you're going to have all these attorney's offices. But most of the medium-sized towns, they have schools and parks, and they have small shopping malls. And most of them still, at this point in time, have businesses downtown. However, as the towns grow and the interstate comes through the town, the downtown area of a larger town is dying because of all the larger malls outside of town. Now, we're trying to resurrect Owensboro in downtown, and they're spending billions of dollars to do it, and I hope it's successful, but I have my doubts. It's very difficult to resurrect in downtown because, of, number one, you've got no place to park. And these small mom-and-pop stores, they cannot begin to compete with the big Wally Worlds and Kmarts. So, coming into the 21st century, what all is going on? Well, more than 50% of our population are now female. We happen to be one of the whitest states in the Union because we got less than 7% population African American, and that's usually located around Louisville or Lexington. We've got about 1% Hispanic or Asian. 
our population growth is down uh, because of the advent of birth control and women limiting the size of their families and more and more women in the workforce you have fewer babies being born and the young that are growing up the teenagers and college age students they're going elsewhere to work and live which leaves behind a very aging population and that's not good about half of our population does go to church regularly and they're Baptist, they're Catholics, they're Methodist, Church of Christ, Jewish faith but for the most part Baptist. Were you surprised to find that Catholic was number two? Education? At one time Kentucky was like 48th or 49th out of 50 states but we're slowly moving up. I think we're up in the 30s now. Approximately 35 percent of our people do not even finish high school and that is usually in the rural areas or in the eastern Kentucky areas. Yet the bluegrass area has the sixth highest according to all 50 states of college graduates. But Davis County is moving up folks. I mean we've got Western Kentucky University, we've got Brescia University, we've got the uh, Kentucky West End College, we've got the Community College, all right here in this one little county. Unfortunately Kentucky has one of the highest rates of lung cancer in the United States. And about 30 percent of our elderly unfortunately do live in poverty. And it's not just the elderly, we have a lot of young single-headed households who are also receiving food stamps because of lack of income. But we have some positive things. I mean we do accept change slowly. We're not radical in any way shape or form. We did not like rock and roll. We did not like the miniskirts and we sure didn't like women wearing pants. But over time we got so that we did accept it. To say that we were in love with it? No. You scratch the surface of a Kentuckian and he'd still like to get rid of these things. We still have our rural traditions and values. And because of that we have genealogical societies to trace back our ancestors and we'd like to preserve our historical areas in our state. And we're always recording oral histories from our ancestors which is great. And the thing I'm the most proud of is Orangeburg has one of the state's lowest crime rates for any city. That's good. Negative? Kentucky's a paradox because women do more housework in Kentucky than men do or children do but we have more independence when you get right down to it. Women suffer more poverty but they have greater economic possibilities. And women do win public office but they do it individually. They don't do it as a group. So you've got the yin and the yang of that. But if you lived in the frontier in Daniel Boone days, you live in a solitary home. You can rarely meet your neighbors. You'd go out and you'd shoot and you'd kill deer to eat or bear or you'd kill an Indian. And the woman stays at home and she takes care of the children. She nurses them if they're sick. She educates them. She cooks the meals. She works in the garden. She slops the hogs. She gets the chickens picked up. She births the babies. Very busy woman. And what the man who's doing the shooting of the game and the woman who's doing the birthing of the babies, what they really want is a better life for their children. And that's not so different than the 21st century. And we don't live solitary homes out in the boonies anymore. We live in the suburbs and we actually get to meet our neighbors pretty regularly. We shop in large malls. We don't go out and kill something to eat. We have available good health care. Mothers are no longer the primary health care giver. We have a good public school system. We have computer technology. It looks good. Those are good things. And we want better life for our children in the 21st century. Our flag says united we stand, divided we fall, and that is so true. I'm very proud to be a Kentuckian. And I think most of us, if you scratch us deep enough, we are. Now you go to any sporting event, and right after they sang the national anthem, what are they saying? My old Kentucky home. And I think if you look around, you'll see more people know the words to my old Kentucky home than they do to the national anthem. We're proud of it. So thus we come to the close of our tour of Kentucky's history. And I hope you've learned to respect our state a bit more. And even with her bottles and idiosyncrasies, she's a great state. Great place to live. So watch the three YouTube videos and then work your quiz and your questions and final tests. And as I stated earlier, this is not an inclusive test. It's only a test over the material since the last test. I hope that you look at Kentucky with better eyes now. And I think the YouTubes will help you. And I want to wish each and every one of you good luck in your future academic endeavors. I have certainly enjoyed having you as students.